Hello everyone and welcome to another video from Carl's Tech Shed. Well as you can see what I've got here is the uh, AMX tablet PC which I picked up from the computer recycling company the other week. Um, I got this incredibly cheap from them because as you can see the uh, touch screen is cracked underneath although the LCD isn't broken itself it's just the resistive touch screen above it is, is completely cracked so it's, it's useless. Uh, this was released around 2004, so it's around 12 years old now. Um, this was never really intended as a, a, a tablet computer in today's terms. It was never intended as, as a tablet PC like you'd have an iPad where you'd surf for web and uh, use applications and such. From what I can tell from the AMX website and the product reviews from the time, this had many uses which included home automation and things like that. So this would, this would have been originally used in the home or in an office and it would have controlled lighting, air conditioning, things like that. So in a way it was, it was just really a fancy toy, but I'm sure you could have used it for other applications if you'd have uh, put different software onto it. On the bottom we have an 18 pin proprietary connector which would be used for a dock so this would be used for power and data transfer. On this side we have a DC barrel connection. On the top we have a standard mini USB port and an infrared port. Now on this side we have a small removable stylus. Uh, on the front we have four customizable buttons on this side and a directional keypad with a central button on this side. We've also got two stereo speakers either side here and on the back we just have a plastic panel over the battery compartment so if we slide that off you can see that we just have two viewpoint power pack batteries in here uh, I'm pretty sure these work independently uh, although I can't test this because these are 7.2 volt lithium-ion cells uh, this would mean that if the system were running uh, without a, an external power input if one of the batteries were running low you could take it out swap it out put another one back in and uh, the, the system would actually continue to run while you were swapping them over which would mean you don't actually have to power the system down which is quite a handy feature really although this is all just speculative because I can't actually power this on um, there's also a little mounting bracket up here so, so uh, you could hang this on a wall or something like that and you'll notice this is made of aluminium this isn't plastic so um, that it, it's going to be incredibly durable rather than if you were to make this out of plastic well now that I've taken the back cover off of this, you can see how sparsely populated the main PCB is. If you compare this to a modern uh, tablet computer like an iPad, the main PCB in those are very densely populated and take up maybe only 10% of the space inside. As you can see here, we've got a lot of surface mount components which wouldn't look out of place in a desktop PC. You've got a lot of uh, voltage regulators and capacitors. You've even got some pin headers here which I can assume would be for testing and configuration and such. Now the main memory isn't actually surface mounted like you'd find on a modern tablet PC. It's actually just a, a compact flash card so this is not only upgradable but it's replaceable um, which is completely unheard of today. Um, but also the Wi-Fi card is also in, mounted into a compact flash slot with the only exception here being this small cable which leads off onto this little aerial which is mounted on the plastic casing. Now if you have a look over here we've got a series of pin headers here. Most of these aren't marked but this one here is marked power override so you could uh, switch the unit on uh, for diagnostics by closing this uh, jumper here. Now this reminds me a lot of the Node Explorer which I did a teardown of several years ago because if you've watched that video you'll remember that that had an AMD Alchemy processor in it and it also had a compact flash card for the memory and for the Wi-Fi card so this has a lot of similarities with that. Now if we take this card out you can see the processor type. This is an RM, uh, RMI AU1100. This is a 400 megahertz uh, system on a chip so this not only has the processor but it also has the onboard RAM, the display controller, touchscreen controller and uh, USB and infrared controller so this is a whole system on a chip and for 2004 when this was produced this is quite impressive. Now you'll notice that on here this is copyrighted 2000. I'm not sure if that chip was actually designed in 2000 or whether it's just copyrighted. 
but uh, even for 2004 it's quite a powerful processor which probably explains the $2,500 price mark of this unit. Now I'm going to take this board out and I'll have a look to see if there's anything else on the other side of this. Well on the other side of this PCB there's all the usual components you'd expect to find. Uh, you've got a lot of power management over here. Uh, you've got some RAM ICs here which are 32 megabytes each. You've got the high voltage cold cathode power supply here and you've also got a couple of flash memory ICs which are there to hold the firmware. I had a look at this small IC here. Uh, this turns out to be a 16 bit 25 megahertz flash microcontroller. I'm not sure really why this is here because it's got a system on a chip on the other side so that's definitely the main processor so my best guess would be that this has been placed on this board simply to run specific applications which may or may not have been developed for this um, which couldn't have been run by the system on a chip perhaps the architecture wasn't right so this was placed as sort of a co-processor so this would run specific applications for the user which couldn't be run on the system system on a chip. Now if we have a look over here um, we've just got a small RS232 controller, we've got a small Altera CPLD here and there's a bit of glue logic going on here and a few connectors for the LCD and the uh, touch panel. And over on this side you've just got all the standard components, you've got a filter, a load of capacitors and some MOSFETs over here. Now one thing which I was surprised at was on the front of this, if I show you the front panel, you can clearly see that there's two speaker grills. But if you have a look on the PCB, there's only one small speaker, and it isn't even a speaker as such, this looks just like a small beeper, so this wouldn't really be able to produce any sounds whatsoever, it would just produce beeps and, uh, and, and tones, so you couldn't listen to music or anything like that on, on this uh, tablet PC. There's not even a headphone port, so you wouldn't be able to use it for that. Now also there's there's also the absence of the audio processor. Now arguably you could say that the audio processing could be done in the system on a chip on the other side, but usually in something that's sold you, you'd expect to find a dedicated uh, audio processor. Because that's so close to the RS232 controller and you've got some glue logic over here, most likely that's going to be there simply to interface the RS232 through the bridge logic and into the system on a chip. Maybe that that's also connected into the microcontroller over here so that everything can uh, communicate properly. Now if we take a close look at this cold cathode high voltage circuit you can see there's a huge creepage distance between the high voltage section here and the low voltage section over here. Um, between the, the actual pins you're looking at about an inch and a half, maybe two inches in most places here. And if you look over here this, this board is, is completely unpopulated with any tracks or any components whatsoever. So there's a lot of, there's some very good isolation around that area. Now one other small feature which I found on this board was a small bodge wire which is on the other side of this board so this is on the side where the infrared LEDs and the main processor is and this is just going between the power supply and this small uh, solder pad which is on the PCB. So if we flip that over and try and trace where it goes, uh, this is actually just going into the high voltage inverter. So I'm not sure if that was an afterthought or, or whether that's intentional because that's the only bodge wire I can find on this whole, uh, on this whole board. So perhaps that was intentional but um, I can't see why they couldn't have just put a single track across that. And I'll just let you have another look at the power management side of this board because you've got so many of these capacitors, inductors, voltage regulators and so on. Whereas in a modern tablet PC these days it would all be done in a, in a single package most likely or, or at least a lot smaller than, than, uh, than what you've got here. Now if we take a look at the LCD you can see it's got this small resistive touch screen over the front of it and you can see where the glass has cracked on this but you can see that the LCD itself which is behind here is not damaged at all. Now if we flip this over you can see that we've got the uh, driver board here for the um, LCD signal and on this side you've just got the high voltage input from the uh, cold cathode power supply uh, for the two tubes to light up the uh, LCD. 
Well as you can see this is very different to the modern tablet PCs that we use today and you have to remember that when this was introduced in 2004 that's only six years before the first iPad was introduced and only three years before the first iPhone so you can see how design and manufacturing techniques have improved just in that short period of time. Well thanks for watching my video and I'll hopefully have another one uploaded soon.